Conventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Right, thanks for downloading another episode of the podcast. Our guest today is retired Command Sergeant Major Tom Satterley, a former Special Operations Soldier who served 25 years in the US Army, the last 20 in Delta Force referred to the, as the unit by those who pass its arduous selection course. As an operator in CSM, Tom fought and led countless military missions across the world. His book, All Secure, is a blunt and honest look at life as a unit operator and the toll it took on him both professionally and personally, and we'll discuss that book later in the podcast. Tom and his wife Jen established All Secure Foundation in August 2017, initially as a resource for helping special operations soldiers and their relatives deal with PTS. They've gone on to assist hundreds of service people and their families through education, awareness, and programs for healing. So, Tom, welcome to the podcast, and thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks, Colin. I appreciate you having me on. We have quite a few civilian listeners to the podcast. I think what we should probably start off with is a, a history of Delta Force, if you can just give us a brief overview. Yeah, um, we're kind of like the baby country. Like we're, little, we're the little baby country that's trying to grow up too fast. And um, I think back in the 60s, they were talking about needing a force that did more than teaching or the conventional fighting. And then uh, I think in the 70s, there were some terrorist incidents, you know, and you had Charlie Beckwith was hanging out with the SAS and, and during that time and, and kind of selling that idea down the road. So in 77, I think in uh, 19 November 77, I'll get that wrong. <laughs> they, they, they came, uh, they were, they were <laughs> activated, but they weren't fully mission capable until the fall of 79. So it took them nearly, you know, a year and a half, couple of years to select those people. Um, I, I always used to joke about them running the first selection, you know, like, hey, you did pretty good. All right, you're selected. And then another guy run through. Yeah, that seemed okay. And then it gets harder for us down the road later, you know, as they increase the, the task to go through. But, you know, to build an organization, I can't, I can't even imagine how difficult it was. But through those incidences, um, that the first one, you know, Eagle Claw in uh, April of 80, failure, right? You start off with a big failure. And so they had a lot to learn. And I think, I think starting off in a failure like that really probably, probably led us down a better path of we need to think of more than just having men together that can go do things. You know, they wanted a force of doers versus teachers, guys that can go out and do direct action. And they're very, very good at it. And that's all they'll do. And they were great. But, you know, they, then they learned that, oh, the enablers, all the support system that goes with it is just as important as that individual that does that work and kicks in and goes in that door. So they had to, it, you know, years and years of building that up up until, God, when I joined, you know, 30 years ago, uh, trying to think of the year, you know, so 89, 90, 90, I'm going through selection and early 91, you know, I'm at the unit and I'm starting off. I'm going through selection with a grease gun still. So it's still, they're still mm -hmm. figuring out what weapon systems are going to work, uh, what really works best. And so they started going outside the U.S. inventory and finding different weapon systems. And then they decided that they're going to take this organization and not only have men that are highly selected and trained and assessed through psychological evaluations, they're also going to have a lot of money to be able to purchase the best Gucci gear possible. You know, and to, to what leads to nowadays where everybody's like, oh, if you've got Gucci gear, anybody can be in the unit. I'm like, no, no, there's a long selection process and it's still the individual mm -hmm. that's amazing that who they select. Um, but, you know, the gear makes it a little easier. So, you know, the, the history of the unit, like I said, started off with with a fail, you know, and, and it's gone on since then to learn hard lessons and valuable lessons. And, and they stick to those lessons that they learn. They don't get drawn into that conventional force mentality. We all have to be the same. We all have to do the same things. It kind of relies on its grassroots level of thinking for the men that they bring in that really drives their, their today. I, you know, they have a winning record. If you ask me, <laughs> they have kind of a winning record of what they've been doing. And, and a lot of things that people don't know about that. There's a large winning record for that, that they're, they're taking care of business out there. So I was proud to be part of that. It's interesting to see about the equipment. We did an interview with Nick, who kindly gave us an introduction, who was in 2-2 SAS in the Falklands, and he was saying about how really poor the SAS's equipment was back in the Falklands War, and they actually borrowed a lot of weaponry and uh, other gear from Delta. So I think it was a common thing back in the 80s, a lot of under-resourcing of sort of special units. Yeah, we've been swapping weapons and kit for years with other organizations, you know, um other organizations have better kit than we have. You know, people find things that work for them in their battlefield and they, they work to invent something better. And we don't know about it, you know, until we bump in and do cross training with those individuals. And we find out, oh, yeah, the SAS has this or the Australians have that or the Germans have this. And we kind of grab it and, and start using what has worked for them. 
There are five Tier 1 units in the United States military, and they are the US Naval Special Warfare Development Group, known as DEVGRO, and most people know them as SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, 24th Special Tactics Squadron, Intelligence Support Activity, and the Army Regimental sorry, the Army Ranger Regimental Recon Company. What are the requirements for a Tier 1 organisation? Is it the tasks they're expected to carry out or the selection procedure? How is it defined? You know, I would have to think it would be defined in the tasks, um, the level of the tasks that you would have to carry out. Um, the selections are all different. Um, some, I would say, don't really have a selection, <laughs> and they wouldn't like me for it. But um, they all have their own selection in different ways. Um, they pick from different groups of people. I think they're looking for different things, so the selections are always different. So I think it would be the the mission and the level of, um, you know, maybe quality, the level of quality that you need or the trust that you need uh, of the individual that you'll have to bring in. So that's why the selections differ so much. So I would I would I would guess that for tier one organizations, you know, what what matters is not the money. You know, like the seals get all kinds of cash, right? When you're comparing a, an aircraft carrier to a couple of dudes who might need some kit, you know, and then the army, they're like, well, you know, we can get away with nothing. And the Marines, the same thing, you know, and and the, and mm. so the Rangers are looking at stuff, and they they just don't have the money that other organizations have. So it's not the money. I think it's just the the mission set that you're going to be asked to do and the level of uh, intensity of it. Obviously. Uh- SEAL Team 6, Dev Grew, they're no strangers to publicity, while your unit actively shuns the spotlight. So what are the other major differences between the two organizations, and is there much joint training and crossover between the two of you? You know, um, that's funny. When I when I wrote my book, a lot of my friends were like, what are you, a Navy SEAL now? <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, I knew it. You know, I knew it was going to come. We have, a, we have that rivalry, but it's a loving rivalry. We all attack each other. You know the deal. You know, we hate you and you suck, but we really love each other because it's just it's, – it's competition and rivalry. But, you know, the selections, like I, I spoke of earlier, are different. Um, who they draw from are different. Now, a lot of people are like, what's the difference between you and the SEALs? Okay, well, us and the SEALs. The SEALs – when you join the Navy, it's not necessarily a combat activity, right? So you're joining the Navy, and it's not a combat individual that's joining. And then when you're in the Navy for a certain amount of time, oh, you want to be a SEAL. Now you go through BUDS, you know, basic underwater demolition school, and they have a hell week. Those guys aren't pulled from a combat arms. So once they learn that, they have to be taught all of those combat arm things, if you ask me. So, of course, I would say the unit would be best <laughs> because they're drawing from people who do <laughs> combat arms initially, right? That was that was where I was born into combat arms as a combat engineer. And most of them are, you know, calling from the, pulling from the Rangers or uh, or SF units. But I've also had people in the Army band go through selection, you know, and make it pretty far. So I think the Army offers at least tier one unit. Uh, the Delta offers um the ability for anybody to go to the selection, anybody from any organization, any military unit, the Navy, the Navy. Um, so and I, and I think um, you look at the unit, they're looking for more mature, more older individuals that have been in for a bit. Um, the Navy, they're pulling from the younger physically fit dudes, you know, so the Rangers, the same kind of thing. They got the younger. So if you look at them, you line them up. You're like, oh, there's an age thing. With with that probably comes a maturity thing. And with that, what was the selection process to bring them in as well? And and um, and I know in the unit, I could speak for the unit and joke about the rest, right? But the unit was a very physical um, event. What will this individual do? And if he makes it and he breaks records and he's, he does the best that everyone's ever done in selection, and I still got to go before the board in a psychological evaluation, and then they still may not take you. I've sat on those boards before where mm. an individual had gone through and he'd done the, the, the fastest ruck march, you know, the fastest PT test. His times were the best. He was a stud. But when I asked him a couple of questions, he couldn't answer those questions and, and nobody wanted him. So here you have this physically fit stud, but nobody wants to work with him because he doesn't have that maturity level. So I think what breaks it down initially would be the selection processes that makes us different. And then the training habit, you know, the training habits after that. And then obviously it, it, it comes into money at some point as well. How much money do you get and how much can you train? And then what are your mission sets? You know, like the Rangers, uh, the recce for the Rangers, that's that's pretty new uh, tier one add on there. I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I can kind of tell you what they do a little bit, but it, uh, I'd be making half of it up, you know. So so I, I think the major differences between the organizations would be the age um, and therefore the maturity of the individuals that they draw from. Yeah, that's very similar to the SAS over in the UK. They tend to recruit an older soldier as well. 
Uh, we don't we don't have as many tiers as you guys have, though. We've copied the sort of the Ranger Battalion with the Parachute Regiment Special Forces Support Group, which is modelled on the Rangers. But uh, that I, f- I found that in your book that quite interesting. That interview panel—that's probably the wrong word that, that you go through. And uh, you know that must be quite a. I don't think I don't think there's any other unit in the British Army does that where you've evaluated on a interview type thing. This and uh, I remember terrifying. reading your book. You're yeah, you're saying in your book you, you're sat outside waiting to go in, and you you're very very probably one of the most nervous times for you. It was the physical part I had. All right, anybody can get physical. You work out enough, you, you know, you probably make it through there, right? I mean, some some don't have it. You got to be physically fit too, but long enough you'll get it, right? But some people you just can't give them long enough on this earth to have those that thought process that they're looking for maybe that you just will never have. The way you were born and raised as a child maybe just affects you. Uh, it doesn't mean you're a horrible person at all. It just means you're not quite ready to come over to where we you know, doing what we need you to do. You're going to have guys operating alone, making large, huge national decisions that would affect so many people. You kind of got to trust that they're going to make a proper decision. So it's terrifying, hey. but it's it's worthy to sit there and put questions to somebody and then sit there for 30 minutes. I'd sit in silence for 30 minutes while they thought about the answer, hoping that would move on. No, we asked a question, so we're going to wait for your answer. And it would be it be scarily silent for 30 minutes while somebody thought of the perfect answer. And then they throw something out and be like, okay, on to the next one. You didn't really care. You just wanted to make sure he put thought into it. And uh, his answer wasn't crazy. So on this interview panel, Tom, I can't really quite remember. Who is it? You, you have the sergeant major. You have, do you have the commanding officer or squadron commander? Who, who the, who's conducting the interviews? Yeah, you have every shrink that spoke to you along the way that's in the room. You probably have the chaplain, you have every squadron sergeant major, every squadron commander, and you have the unit sergeant major and the unit commander, and then some other people just to make you nervous, I think. Um, so there's a room full of people that have been in the organization for many, many years, and they've gone through many, many uh, missions and things that you want to take part in, and they're all just staring at you. And you're, you're one guy in a chair on the stage looking at them, and they're asking you all questions and these weird, funny questions that, you know, would make no sense. And, and you just have to sit there and think, why are they asking me this yeah. weird, weird, funny question? And then you have to answer in, with, with your best, you know, the best information that you have. Not what you think they want to hear, obviously, because you would never know. But yeah. but what is in the brain of Tom Satterley? What is what does he think in a situation that I just presented to you? And I have to sit there like, oh, my God, I would never be in a situation like this, I hope. But if I was and, it, you know, there's situations that no one's going to win. Let's say you're going off to a mission yeah. with four guys or five guys and you're in behind enemy territory and, you know, the minimum requirement is two and, and one guy has a breakdown on the way, you know, but you, you can't fail the mission. There's no way this mission can fail, you know. So what do you do? He has a breakdown. He's screaming and people are going to capture you, you know, if, if you don't. Some guys are like, well, I'd kill him and bury him in the market. You know, other guys are like, oh, I'd, I'd quit the mission and bring him home. And I was like, oh, shit, I don't know. Do half and half. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd leave him there with one guy and I'd go off with another guy and do the mission and come back and hopefully pick him up on the way. I, I don't know. There's no win-win to these questions. They just want to make sure that you're not thinking like that guy. Oh, I'd put a bullet in his head and bury him, right? Oh, he's your teammate, man. Why would you say that? Well, you said no fail mission. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, what's your thought process kind of thing? And, and there's no winning to these these answers. It's just how much damage can you mitigate while you answer that question in front of those guys? So stepping back a bit then, uh, what year did you enlist and what made you sign up for the Army? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I enlisted in 86 and I was my, a friend of mine joined the Army. And I was like, see you later, fool. And I, I was building houses. So I was <laughs> swinging a hammer and building houses and I didn't know what I was going to do. I was a kid, right? I, I hadn't put much thought into it. I'm, I'm in Indiana, right? I mean, that's it's in the middle of nowhere, doing nothing, redneck, Hoosier stuff. Um, he came back. After basic training, and we were on our way to a concert up in Indianapolis, so it's like an hour and a half drive. And all the way up, he's telling me about basic training, and he's off to Germany, and he's going to be in Germany for two years and live there, and and he's been trained on this, and he's going to choose this job. And I thought, man, he's going to Germany. I will never leave this country if I don't get out of here now. And on that drive up, I thought, I think I'm going to join the Army, and I'm going to get some college money, and in four years, I'll get out, and I'll go to college, and I'll have money. Yeah, that night I signed up. Went home and told my parents who freaked out. And then I, uh, yeah, I went off. That was uh, the summer of 85, the fall of 85. I had a a delayed entry date to February of 86. And so I I came in in February of 86 and started that journey. And it was one of those uh, four years in and out. You know, I'm going to get some money 
And I, you know, I got off to Germany and it was a whole different ballgame. It was just a different, it was different than what I thought. So I thought I'd stick around and give it some more time. And did you quite like the soldiering in Germany? Because at some point you obviously decided it wasn't for you, but did you sort of click instantly with the soldiering over there or were you quite dissatisfied early on? I hated it. I thought I, <laughs> <laughs> on a uh, I, I hated it. I thought I was the most squared away guy there because I, I, I and I kind of was. Um, I thought, where did I go? How, how do we win wars? These guys are crazy. Nobody lets them do anything. So they all give up anyway. You know, even if you're motivated in the regular army and you're like, I want to go do this. I want to train with my guys. And your, your boss would tell you we're broke. Shut up, sit down and clean your weapon or go to the motor pool and take care of your vehicle that never goes anywhere anyway. And I'm thinking this blows. This blows. I'm going to do nothing but sit in the barracks. And, and, you know, some guys like that doing nothing. I was too young to like that. So I started looking around and we were lucky that we had a platoon sergeant that was a former Hungarian, um, was in, in the former, formerly in the Hungarian army. And he had joined the U.S. Army and he knew of some training opera opportunities in Germany. And um, he talking about French commando school and German ranger school and the Swiss march and platoon confidence training down in Bad Tolts. And, and I thought, whoa. That sounds cooler than going to the motor pool, you know? So we started doing things like rappelling and rocking and, and things that I would have never done. I would have never done those things, and I would have hated what I was doing in the Army. And so I got a different taste, and I liked it. And uh, I, I, I kind of wanted more. You know, I didn't soldier at first. I, it was easy to soldier. It was easy to me to do the right thing and, and do it well um, by their standards, you know, I thought. And uh, mm -hmm. I wanted more. I wanted to be challenged a little bit more. So those three years that I was in Germany, I got, had that opportunity to do each one of those things. German Ranger School, French Commando School, Platoon Confidence Training in Bad Tolts and the Swiss March. And I thought, man, I want more. You know, and my buddy had a, a picture he carried around with him of his dad holding him wearing it as a baby. And he was wearing his dad's Green Beret from Vietnam. He's like, I'm going to be a Green Beret. And I thought right then I went, that's my dream, too. I stole his dream. I said, I'm going to be a Green Beret as well. So, you know, I set my sights to become a Green Beret. And that was my, you know, that was my goal then was to get that Green Beret, get to Fort Bragg, and then figure out anything after that. It's interesting how you mentioned that sergeant who has an influence on you because I think for a lot of soldiers, it takes a key personality can change their life a bit. And I had a very similar thing. I was posted to uh, Germany as well, didn't like it. I was in the office one day looking for an out and uh, basically the, uh, the sergeant major took me under his wing and gave me the guidance I needed that, that got me into a line of work that was far more suited to. So once you became an older soldier, did you, I mean, probably not so much in the unit, I'd imagine, but that sort of guiding and mentoring people, did that influence your, how you approach younger soldiers later on? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, a lot of the guys go to the unit from SF or from the Rangers and they hadn't led anybody yet. So they don't have any leadership experience. I was in Germany for three years, and on my second year, I'd already made E5. It was that easy. And then, boom, I'm in charge. I'm a squad leader, and I'm in charge of, like, ten dudes, you know? And I'm like, okay, so I just tell you what to do, right? And I show you how to do it. I, I do it with you, and then I back off and let you do it, you know? And it, it, it was kind of easy. So when I got to the unit, having some experience in leadership was good. And I, I think that I learned in the regular army that way and learning from my leaders then to listen to the good ones and know when they're the good ones, right? And know when to follow the good ones. Cause you can have some shitty leaders that are easy to follow, but they're taking you nowhere, nowhere good anyway. But you can mm -hmm. really have a profound effect on someone. Um, if you watch them long enough and understand what their interest is and then kind of guide them to get what they want, to work through it and get what they want, not give it to them, but work through and get what they want. And then they're proud of themselves. You're proud of them and everybody's happy. And then they move on and they grow more. I learned so much from my leaders that way. Um, starting out in the regular army from that one platoon sergeant you know i had another uh my first sergeant was you know in vietnam he was burnt out I, we had a lot of people back in the day that were from vietnam that were burnt out you know they were riding their time i got it i i, I get it when i was at 25 years i'm riding my time like leave me alone man i'm i'm an old cow now let, let me just ride this out but they weren't they weren't in the mood to teach people so having somebody motivated that didn't go to vietnam that still wanted to get out there and get at it um you know, he was a key asset and a key um, person that pointed me in the right direction for my career. You know, I would say in the right direction. It almost tore me apart and ruined my life, but it was a good thing to do as a job. I mean, those were great 
opportunities to have. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of the leaders over me that, that guided me along that path. Yeah, it's a classic platoon sergeant thing that they should be doing. But actually, there's, I, I look back on it and very few really do it because it's they take the path of least resistance. And especially in Germany in the 80s, it was a garrison job. They had their families there. They're more interested in knocking off at four o'clock. And then yeah. uh, that was it, treating like an office job, I think. Yeah, it's like an everyday job then. You don't even think of war. And then when they go out and do something hard, they're like, this is horrible and I hate my job. I'm like, man, imagine if we were at war, how much you'd hate it. You know, that's, I always, I always looked at my job yeah. as you need to be ready to, to do the worst things, right? To live in the worst conditions and to do the worst things. So when everything was easy, you know, I would always take my squad out. Let's go out and do the woods and just do something. Let's make it horrible. You know, let's, let's go make it suck for a little bit. So we learn how, you know, how to improve upon that. Versus sitting on the couch and yeah. watching TV. I think we were quite lucky, my generation. So I joined in 85, so we had a generation of guys that three years before were fighting in the Falklands. Uh, and that was, you know, a dismounted operation, close combat. And those guys were venerated by us. You know, if you found out somebody's a Falklands veteran, especially from the infantry, it was like, well, sit, you know, just sit back and absorb everything this guy's going to tell you because he's, he's done it for real. They were they were amazing. We learned so much. We used to go over there often and learn um, a lot of surveillance techniques, right, from from that area and that time frame and those guys. Um, we learned everything we know about what we use now from from those boys. You went into a Green Beret selection, and if I remember rightly, reading your book, you, you didn't find that too tough. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it was fun. It was uh, it was hard, right? It, <laughs> it was hard. hard, but I was in really good shape. I was lightweight. I mean, I was 150 soaking wet back then. You know, I was in, in peak physical shape just because, I, you know, I, I wanted it so bad. I didn't find it that difficult to work as a team, uh, you know, and I just kept going. I didn't have that quit in me. I don't know why. I was too terrified. I didn't want to be embarrassed. I, I was just, I don't know what it was that kept me going. People are like, what, what keeps you going? I'm like, man, I don't know. Just the embarrassment of quitting, I guess. I just, the fact that I couldn't do it and I'm lucky that somebody didn't ask me at the right time. Right. Like, you want to quit? I mean, if they asked me at the right time, I'd have probably quit a couple of times, you know, but they didn't. So, I, I you know, it was a uh, it wasn't easy, but I had a good time just because I was in shape and I could feel myself getting stronger during that selection. It was weird. It was like it was supposed to break you down. I could feel myself growing and getting stronger. And your route to the unit was quite strange. Can you just talk people through how you were approached? So if I remember rightly, you'd just finished the Green Beret course. Yeah. And somebody approached. Somebody approached you and handed you a business card, essentially. Yeah, I was in language school, which was just a cross post. Um, and those old, we were in old World War II barracks. And, you know, you go for an hour and you'd come out and you'd have a 10-minute break. Every 10-minute break, you know, I'd go out and just sit around and relax. And one of the breaks, two guys that I went through the Q course with who were in the unit at the time, and I didn't know it. The whole Q course time we went through, I didn't know it. I mean, you know, and I was friends with one of them. And they came up to me in language school during one of the breaks like, hey, think you got what it takes, you know, you should be in the unit. I'm like, oh, what's that? Oh, you know, the unit, you know, uh, it's tier one. It's like, SF, it's a Delta. And I'm like, whoa, what? You know, and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We think you have what it takes. So here's a card. You need to call this number. And I go, okay. And I put in my pocket. Like, no, like right now. I go, huh? Right now? Yeah, yeah. Call them right now. They're waiting for you. I'm like, oh shit. And I got nervous. And so I called them. It was just the recruiters. And they're like, hey, I want to set up a time to come give you a test and then run you through some psychological paperwork. And I'm like, uh, I'm in language school. I'm like, yeah, we'll come over to you. And I'm like, okay. So, I, so. You know, they come over and give me a PT test, like probably within a week. And I take a PT test, do some paperwork, and I get a selection date. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got to go to selection now in four months, you know. And so every break, every 10-minute break, I'm out there doing flutter kicks and push-ups and sit-ups. And, like, I have to get in shape now. Like, I'm already in shape, but I have to get in more shape. These guys are crazy. So I spent the next five, six months um, working out, just, just working out. You know, I went from language school to 5th Special Forces Group. And everybody in that group was deployed to the first Gulf War, except for the injured and except for me because I was non-deployable because I had a selection date. And I was so pissed off. You know, I wanted to go to war. And now I got a date for selection. Like, <laughs> selection trumps war. You're not going to war. And I'm like, what? So I had that time to work out with nobody there. And uh, I just got harder and harder. I swam every day. I ruck marched every day. I like wet boots and wet socks. And I'd ruck till my feet were dry and blistered. And then I'd toughen them up. And I just did everything I could. And I, I enjoyed selection as well. I mean, it nearly killed me, but I enjoyed it. It's just one of those, it's going to break you down to your, to your last limit anyway. And some people, their last limit was before the end, and mine was at the end or, or beyond maybe. And 
I was getting close. And like I said, I would have quit along the way had somebody asked me at the right time. <laughs> like when I'm humping up a mountain and I'm cussing the world and I'm, you know, and I lose my compass and I'm freaking out and ask me then, I probably would have walked right on and got in the truck with you right away. But it was just never one of those opportune times. But it was, uh, yeah, they snuck up on me and asked me and I thought, yeah, I'll go to selection, man. I, I just kept chasing that next thing. I didn't really have a plan. People are like, were you very patriotic and you had a plan? I'm like, no, no plan, man. I, I, didn't, I didn't even think I was going to join the Army until the day I did. You know, and I, I didn't think I was going to go to selection until they walked up and asked me in language school. I'm like, oh, okay. It just is one of those, hey, what's next? What's next? What's next? And so, yeah, went on to selection. And It seems to me, though, sorry, Tom, it seems to me you're a very driven person, though. You, know, you say you had no plan, but you've had a sort of bit of chance encounters. But once something's put in your head... You're highly, highly motivated. Yeah, if I'm given opportunity, I'm going to take it, you know? Um, yeah, I, I was the guy that would take that, if I wanted it, I would take that opportunity and run with it and do everything in my power to make sure I made that. Mm. And so for selections, to me, what I'd learned in Germany was if, you know, in my mind as a young person, if I need to ruck 40 miles, I better go out and ruck 80 miles every day, you know, until, until 40 miles is easy. That way, when I go do it, it, it won't be easy, but it'll be a lot less than 80, and I'll make it. And so I just kind of overtrained every day, really. I mean, I didn't overtrain, but I mean, I, I trained on that fine line of breaking my body down and, and making sure I was healed up right. Um, I probably went into selection a little bit tired. So after that, I started teaching people to go in healthy. Like, go healthy, man. Don't go in tired. Don't overtrain. But yeah. I, just, I, I just approached everything with that mentality of, if it's going to be hard, I'll do it twice as hard now. So when they ask me to do it, it won't be that hard. And I kind of took that with selection as well. On SES selection, it's sort of divided into what they call the aptitude phase, which is a couple of weeks at the start where it's all physical. They're out in the hills and, and the mountains of Brecon and Beacons. Uh, and then they'd go on, do a little bit of continuation training, and then they do uh, the jungle phase. And you can talk to some guys that get into Hereford and they say that, you know, the physical bit is there mainly to make sure you can weed out the people that shouldn't be there, but also make sure you're up to the physical rigors of the jungle. And the main selection is done in the jungle. How does that compare to what you were doing on unit selection? I think the selection process was designed to, and probably learned from the SAS and, and combined down into one, let's find out, let's select first versus select during. And it might have been a financial thing, like, well, if we teach you to do this along the way, and then we teach you to do this, and then we throw you into something that's really, really hard, and you don't make it, we just wasted a lot of money. So maybe they went up front and find out, okay, who can physically do this kind of thing? And who can mentally, um, hopefully, stand up to this kind of work in these hours? Okay, we'll do that up front. Now let's train you on something. And nothing in selection has changed since the start of it, minus a couple of things that they figured out didn't matter. They've been trying to get them to change selection for years and years and years. The government cracking down. You need to change selection just to make it easier to get people in, to get the numbers up, right? We've never had the amount of people we were supposed to have in the unit. It's never been fully manned. They just don't have enough people that pass selection to fill it. And then plus people do the job and get tired and it wears you down and they leave too. So it's hard to fill. But they've never changed it. And the only thing they changed was we used to have a swim test early on in selection. And then they decided that that was a teachable skill. So you have to be able to swim by the end of the operator training course. And if not, then you don't, you, sorry, you don't get it anyway. So they're kind of banking on the fact that they can teach you to swim. Um, but they had the swim test in there be, um, in selection because people had drowned crossing streams in selection. So they wanted to make sure you could swim before they put you into crossing a stream of selection. So now that I think they might have removed as many stream crossings as possible and, and they monitor that. I think they just moved into the fact that let's find out if you're physically and mentally capable first. And then let's teach you. And I think in the order that they teach things, they teach it into, into the order of not the simplest, but maybe the most important skills that are financially not as involved. Pass that, pass that. Mm -hmm. And then they move up to the real expensive stuff, you know, like the driving and, and all that other stuff that gets expensive if you mess it up later. So by the time you get to that really expensive, hard stuff to train on, um, they know that you're pretty much going to make it there anyway, you know. Yeah, it's interesting that, that physicality is still looked upon as crucial. And you see it in the British Army, I think sometimes they're always trying to water down the physical standard, uh, saying that, you know, it's all about the technology. But to me, even for non-Special Forces soldiers, being fit is not just about being able to run from A to B quickly or carry weight. It's about 
um, staying awake for longer, being able to function with less food and all that. And I think sometimes the people in charge sort of miss that. So it's, it's interesting to see that they've not really touched your selection course in the 40 odd years of its existence. Yeah, I remember they, they used to come at us hard and try to get us to change things and they would fight it. They would fight it like, no, we're not changing it. We're not going to let people in just because, because it works. It works. We don't want, you know, and the physical fitness part is, well, if you can't take care of your body, what else will you take care of? Your body is what mm. takes you around this planet. It's what keeps you alive. If you're not going to take care of that, you know, we'll beat it up for you. <laughs> That's what the unit says. We'll beat it up for you. You keep it in shape. We'll break it for sure. You know, and then you start wearing down. But that weight on my head, the entire 20 years I was in the unit, it was my physical fitness. You know, I remember the day where I was a team leader in charge of my six guys, and the Sergeant Major did a Sergeant Major day. <clears throat> These young studs are coming in every day now, and I'd been there for 10, 10, whatever, some years maybe. And we were doing a Sergeant Major event, and I was carrying a sledgehammer, and I started falling behind. And I was devastated. My team's trying to take my sledgehammer out of my rucksack. Oh, well, to help me run fast. I'm like, get away from me. I hate you. You know, like, no. But I had to. They took the sledge out of my rucksack mm. and took the extra weight, so I could run faster so we could, you know, win the event or, or whatever versus fall way behind and lose. And I won't forget that day. I won't forget that day, the day yeah. I couldn't keep up with the young dogs, you know, that were running and biting on my heels the whole time. And I knew it was going to happen one day. And I, I'll remember the day it happened. And I'll probably never forget that day that my physical ability was outmatched by people younger and stronger than me. And I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. I think I started working out even harder after that. But up to a certain point, you're not catching those kids anymore, you know? You can't outrun age, Tom. No. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Physical fact, isn't it? Yep. As much as much as we all want to deny it. Started learning that then. <laughs> what sort of person are they looking for? You know, they're looking for the person that's going to do the right thing almost all the time, right? You know, they're not looking for perfect people. They're looking for people who would do the right thing, make proper decisions, can stand stand toe to toe right there, not want to walk away or quit. You know, they're looking for people who won't quit and who make good decisions, you know. And physical fitness and land navigation is part of that decision process and the stress and always oh, fit and, and the timing of it. And, and it's, it, you know, and he's got to go faster and faster and to meet that time and the stress of that. So they're looking for somebody who can put their own personal stress on because that's where we get most of our stress is self-induced anyway. So how can you put so much stress on yourself during a selection process and still pass, you know, while nobody talks to you? They write everything on the chalkboard. Nobody says anything to you. You know, it's all just written, written instructions. So. They're looking for those individuals who can make those good decisions, uh, do it alone, right? And even when other people are making the wrong decision around them, they'll make the, the hard right decision because they have to. They know that you're going to be put in a position one day to where you, you might be alone and making national decisions for your country. Obviously, when you get into the unit, you then move on to specializations. So really, what sort of specializations did you do? And, wh and what was your welcome like when you turned up as a new guy? <laughs> My welcome. My team leader, I drug my bags into my new squadron bay and I set them down. I'm like, here I am, you know, and the two I see is like, uh, Pete will be here in a little bit. He's your team leader. He's getting ready to go on a trip. You know, he was doing protection in Beirut and he was getting ready to head off into Beirut for uh, three or four months. And so he walks up and somebody's like, hey, Pete, this is Tom is your new guy on the team. And he looks at me. He's an he old dude, man. He looked at me. He said, great. You got a lot to learn. And he left. And he got on a plane and took off, and I didn't see him for four months. And so my team leader, the first thing he said to me was, you've got a lot to learn. <laughs> and I didn't see him for four months. I was like, oh, God, this is horrible. What have I done, you know? And so the two I see and everybody took, took me under their wing and started training me up. So by the time he got back, I kind of knew what I was doing a little bit, just a little bit. Because you're on probation for another 18 months after OTC. They're, like, watching you like a hawk. And then you're on probation every day after that. I think the saying is selection's an ongoing process. So every day you're being yeah. selected to stay here, so don't don't screw it up. But yeah, that wasn't uh, it wasn't a it wasn't a good hug and a kiss day. It was one of those oh god, another new guy. Great, I'll see you later. You know, <laughs> and off he went. But uh, yeah, six months later we had two more new guys. You know, from the next class, so I wasn't the new guy anymore. <laughs> and it was, and yeah. it moves on that quick. Yeah, I can imagine. Eighty months into your tour of the unit, you were sent to Mogadishu as part of Op Gothic Serpent, uh, and that was the mission to capture uh, Somali warlord Mohammed Farah Adid, who was deemed responsible for the pre previous ambush and death of 24 Pakistani UN peacekeepers. Uh, and a lot of people will be more familiar with this through the film uh, Black Hawk Down. 
So the attempt to arrest the deed resulted in an 18-hour firefight, the longest since Vietnam, in which 18 Americans were killed and 73 wounded. So accurate casualties for the Somalis don't exist, but 312 killed and 814 wounded has been reported. The fighting also had strategic implications to the US government called the Somalia effect that has been reported as preventing the US from intervening in the Rwandan genocide. While it's probably safe to say the mission didn't define you as an operator, Tom, it did cast a long shadow over you both professionally and personally. So you could just talk us through the events of that day from your perspective and what you took away from it and why it influenced you down the road a bit. Yeah, that day, my perspective going into that day was was like our first five missions that we had had, you know? Maybe you shoot at each other. Maybe. There's some noise. Some people, you know, you might shoot the bad guys and then maybe a ranger got injured, you know, and you're like, oh, but, you know, and you come back and you tell all kinds of stories. You see that, man, a crazy thing that happened and... You know, and, and then you win the day, right? We're the good guys. And then 3 October was, uh, it changed instantly. I mean, on infill, I was infilled outside of the perimeter uh, with our with our, with our our whole element. There was brown out everywhere, so we were outside the ranger perimeter. We knew we had to work our way in without hopefully not getting shot. We had to take down a house just to get off the street. We were under fire immediately. And I'd heard on the radio that somebody had fallen out of a helicopter on, a, you know, these 90-foot fast ropes. So I knew that was going to be bad. Finally hit the ground and, and took the house down and fought our way to the target and finally got to the target where they had detained um, probably 15 detainees. I don't, I don't remember the number. It was a lot. We were searching that building and it was it was exfil time, just like always. You know, I, I was mad because I just made it to the target. Didn't get shot by the Rangers. I was pretty happy about it. And uh, <laughs> you're right, right. You got to work your way in like it's, it's <laughs> us now. Don't shoot. And we get inside and, and we're ready to go again. I'm like, man, I didn't get anything. Another mission, you know, down. It wasn't that much. So we're ready to exfil. And then all of a sudden a, a five-ton truck gets hit with a with an RPG and blows up and outside on the street. And it's like, okay, all right, it's getting sporty now. And then I was sitting there looking, and I had a huge garbage bag full of Somali cash. I mean, I was going to take it back and turn it in. I thought it was, it was probably worth a dollar if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I had it from the target. I'm like, I can't, you know. And I look up in the air, and I, I see an RPG flying, and it hits the tail rotor of another helicopter. And I see it spiraling out of control and crashing off to our northeast. Off to our northeast. And I thought, oh, shit, I knew right then, right? Like, this is this is bad. This is getting bad. We need to get out of here. And there was gunfire everywhere, and I ended up throwing that money into a sewer hole in that little courtyard we were in. And I pulled out a knife and started slashing the tires of the car that was parked at that house because that was a target building. I didn't want anybody, you know, that we were leaving behind to come after us or mess with us. And and they started making a plan to to, to walk down the street. You know, we were no longer going back home. And right then, a ranger got shot in the neck through the gate he was leaning against, just relaxing. You know, just leaning against the gate, chilling, his neck explodes. I'm like, oh, shit, this is getting bad, you know. So I started getting a little nervous, but I'm still making jokes. You know, that's my stress thing. Are we going to make it home for dinner kind of thing? You know, uh, what are we having tonight? And it was one of those stress things. And next thing you know, we're on both sides of the street in files, pushing, pushing, you know, east and turning north with thousands of Somalias uh, a block away, shadowing our every move up the street. Just just following us. And every time we'd cross an intersection, there was this huge firefight going back and forth both ways. And we had to run past the intersection and, and make it out of there. And, and, and we knew that the Somalis were racing us to the crash site. And we knew we had to speed up to get there before them. So you have to give up security when you have speed. So we just started moving fast. And remember, turned the corner and headed north. And I, we were in the middle of the street shooting towards the crash site. And I looked over and they were dragging Earl away. And I just thought, oh, Earl got wounded. You know, oh, shit, Earl got wounded. And I, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't know anything of it until we got back. And that Earl had been killed instantly that second. Shot in the face, you know, wearing plastic helmets at the time because we'd rather be fast, right? And uh, mm -hmm. working our way down that street, it got worse and worse until we got to the crash site. And then, you know, we took a house down right at the crash site. And another team took a house down across the street from us. And we had about four women in the house and two ma males in the house. We had to, you know, detain them and keep them there. And then the rest of the night was just hammering of that house with RPGs and, and AK-47 fire. And then the brass from the miniguns and the little birds coming. And, and, and just thank God for them with the rockets and the miniguns keeping the thousands of people at bay that were just trying to get into us the whole night. And it was one of those... Um, I mean, I can't even go through all the incidences that happened that night. You know, one guy crawling on his hands and knees trying to sneak up to my window. I had to drop a grenade on his head right outside my window. And 
it goes off and everybody comes running in the room like, what was that noise? You know, I got the ceiling sprayed with hair and dirt and sand and shit. And the room's full of smoke. And, and there's somebody in the room going, he threw a grenade pointing at me. And I go, no, yeah, I was a flashbang. I was lying. It was a flashbang. <laughs> he looked at me, he goes, you're lying. That was a grenade. I go, yeah, you're right. It was a grenade. Damn it. I blew this dude up. Man, I, I don't know why I lied. Um, I'd never blown anybody up with a grenade like right next to me before. It was one of those, um, like, oh, I'm in trouble kind of things. Like, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And then the rest of the night was just, okay, this is horrible hell. Our house was on fire. It had a huge hole in it from an RPG that hit one of my friends that was sitting on the couch right there. And it was nonstop 18 hours of them just trying to get in and get at us. And, and I'd run out of ammunition at one point, well, twice, and I ran out of water. And they had a resupply come in sometime in the night, helicopter hovering right over the head of our, of our target building throwing out ammunition, throwing out five-gallon jugs of water and water bottles and everything. And they started taking fire from the building right next door to us from the second floor. And I was like, nobody even knew anybody was up there. And they were right next door to us. They could have thrown grenades and things down on us, you know? And so uh, mm -hmm. kind of knew how dire it was that night, you know, and, and all night long. And, and I remember the team leader coming in one time. He's like, just checking on us. And I looked at him like, hey, uh, are they going to make it? You know, the convoy had been trying to get to us all night long. You could hear the gunfire. It was just the volume of gunfire was nonstop all night long. And you could tell it was changing directions. You could tell it was trying and moving around. I was like, hey, uh, you think they're going to make it? <laughs> he goes, kind of like he said when he was off, off on his way to Beirut. You know, you got a lot to learn and left. He, he looked at me, he goes, I don't know. And he turned and left. I'm like, well, shit. <laughs> well, shit. You know, that would have been a good time to lie to me or something. And uh, <laughs> that moment, that moment, I just decided that I was dead. I kind of just decided that I wasn't going to make it. I knew. It wasn't a decision. I knew that I wasn't going to make it and that I needed to create as much damage to help as many of my friends as I could, you know, kill as many as I could before I got killed to help my friends as much as possible. And I just, I felt better the rest of the night. I didn't give a shit because I already knew the outcome. And I just kind of became a beast. And, uh, and then next thing you know, the sun's, Almost coming up, and there's the you know there's the tenth mountain division. Start walking up the street with two Pakistani vehicles leading the way. Just uh, you know, I was like, whoa, what a sight for sore eyes you guys are to show up. Now you might want to get off the street. And one dude come running and looking for some Copenhagen right away. Anybody got any Copenhagen? I go, God, man, you 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 dip addicts, man. No matter what's going on, you guys are worried about Copenhagen. I was hoping you'd bring us some Copenhagen, but you know, we finally got the bodies piled on top of the vehicles and all the wounded put in the back of those vehicles. And we made a plan to to climb in the vehicles and, and go out. And they're like, well, there's not enough room inside these vehicles. Well, okay. Well, what are we going to do now? Well, you walk alongside these vehicles. We'll use them as cover. And we'll just drive on back to where the rest of the convoy is. And you get in a vehicle there. Okay. It's about a mile. All right. As soon as the first bullets started flying, those vehicles took off fast and just took off and left us. So there we are running the Mogadishu Mile um, with no cover. Not our full complement of people, that's for sure. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many of us ran the Mogadishu Mile. I, I don't know. I didn't see that many people. Um, I was picking up magazines off the street, knocking dirt out of them, putting them in my weapons just so I'd have like three rounds to shoot at somebody and then look for more ammunition somewhere because I was out of ammunition again. Um, hmm. Finally made it back to the convoy and loaded up on two unarmored Humvees. <laughs> the two, no armor on them. And those guys took off driving. And they went the wrong way. So the two vehicles that I was with, um, part of my team and two people from another team were on the vehicle, drove to the back gate of the airport, around by the port, which was the longer way to go. And everybody else in the armored vehicles went to the Pakistani stadium, which was closer. And I, I, you know, I never knew why um, until about two years ago when I think I did a podcast and I was talking about it. And somebody emailed me and wrote me and said, hey, I drove that vehicle and here's why we, we got lost. I'm like, no shit. So I finally figured out why we went the wrong way. They got lost and cut off and, and they were trying to hammer us all the way back. And um, I remember pulling up to our, once I left the back gate and no one else showed up at the airport, I thought, well, we need to drive around to our hangar and see what, what's going on. You know, nobody followed us. So they're all dead or something. I don't know. Because our radios were dead. And when we drove around by our, our, by our um, hangar where we were staying, I saw like 10 or 12 bodies lined up along the street covered in ponchos and poncho liners. I'm like, whoa. Then I started noticing the boots. I see jungle boots and Adidas assault boots. And I knew what Adidas assault boots meant. You know, that was, that was unit. And I, I started mm -hmm. taking in the toll 
a, a little bit of the toll. And then we turned and pulled into our compound. And there were Humvees with blown out windows and blown apart. And there was piles of sand and blood and, and clothes cut off. And just I could smell bleach and the rising sun was heating the day. And I could smell the blood and the bleach on that asphalt with the sand. And I'll never forget that smell. And that was from the convoy people who had come, gone in and out all night and would bring back their wounded and drop them off and try to clean the vehicles out and reload and go back out to try to get back to us all night long. And they just kept going through that hell. And then... uh so probably within 30 minutes, helicopters started landing, and they were transporting people from the Pakistani stadium back to the airfield. They were bringing back people, and that's when I started realizing how many people had been killed and wounded and, and, and that we were missing people, you know. And that's when I got real angry and started cleaning all my stuff and reloading my weapons, like, let's go. Let's go back out and kill this whole town, right? And I think, thankfully, our leaders made the decision of, like, no. No, no, no. We're not going anywhere right now. Like, you guys are too emotionally involved in this. Plus, we were devastated, you know, um, as an organization. It's interesting. You, you said during that account there that at one point you thought, right, I'm going to die here. And you, you accepted it. And it had like a calming effect, because more or less. And that's the second time I've heard somebody say that, because we had a platoon sergeant from the Royal Irish uh, Regiment on talking about his tour of Afghanistan. And he said something very similar to what you've just said. There came a point on the tour where he just said, right, I'm not going to make it out of here. More or less said what you said there. I've ex- I accepted that, he said, and I was a better soldier for the rest of the tour for it. I just accepted my fate. Have you heard anybody else say that type of thing to you, Tom? Is that something you recognize in other soldiers that you've worked with? Yeah, I've seen, uh, I've seen people and I've heard people talk about that thing that keeps you from doing something, fear. Like, I don't want to die. The fear of death, right? The actual fear of death. If I jump up while I hear all that popcorn popping overhead there, you know, those bullets zipping by. If I jump over this wall, I'm probably going to get shot by one of them. And it might be in my face or somewhere bad, you know. And so when you kind of resign yourself to the fact that, well, it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. It's preordained or not. I can't control it. And when you see little kids pick up a weapon and shoot one of your highly trained mates, you're like, that kid hadn't gone through anything. He just picked up a gun and put it in the direction. This highly trained individual is now dead. I mean, what? you can't make sense of that. You know, you can't make sense of that. So it's yeah. it's one less thing to worry about for me. And and other people have decided, like, oh, I'm going to die anyway, so let's just go make some craziness, you know. And, and that might be their courage, you know, their braveness of or stupidity. That's a fine line, right? It's a fine, fine line between mm. those two. Of screw it, I'm gonna run through that hail of bullets, and if I don't get hit, I'm a hero. If I do get hit, I'm a casualty. You know, that's the difference. Mm. Another thing I want to ask you about Somali was, I think often Western armies underestimate the opposition. And when I was delving a bit behind this, I didn't realize that the person that organized the defense against uh, the force out there was a Somalian uh, general, I think it was. Yeah, and he he was able to manipulate people and, and, and make them react really quickly to set up barriers. And it reminded me of something I read about the Second World War where somebody was talking about how good the Germans were at reorganizing into battle groups. And, and they turned around and said, as a counter-argument, it's easy to organize quickly when you don't have much. And I think that's probably the case over there in Afghanistan and Iraq. Again, we underestimated them. We looked upon them as third world armies. And I think, yeah, that might have been the case in Gulf War One. But when you're fighting an insurgency, I think too often we underestimate people. Is that a fair comment, you think? Oh, that's so fair. That is so fair. We always underestimate, right? We always. We're the winners. We're the good guys. It's supposed to be. Even people who are getting yeah. murdered won't put up a fight as they beg their murderer to stop because they're hoping there's good there, right? They're hoping for the good to show up and just stop this awfulness. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, – I've seen it everywhere. All the time. It's it's a fair, it's yeah, a fair no, assessment I, for sure that we always underestimate. We're smarter, right? We have to tell ourselves that or we wouldn't really want to go to war. Right? I, it's called recruitment. You know, It gets me to do things I don't really want to do. I tell myself how good I am at it and the other people are stupid and they're not even trained. And again, when you see a little kid pick up a rifle and shoot your buddy, you're like, well, all that bullshit, you know, went away. I just realized that yeah. there's zero training, zero attitudes, just just – just equipment and, and his finger. He knew how to work it. Boom. Done. You know? And luck. I, mean, I don't know if you believe so in luck or luck. fate, but I, I certainly, you know, luck. I certainly believe in luck or bad luck, you yeah. know? Um, 
I'd rather be so, lucky, lucky than good. I'd rather be lucky. <laughs> and you can't train for luck. You've just got to, you've got to have it right. get gifted to you. I think. What movie was that? It was a so, superpower. Luck was this girl's superpower in a movie. It was a funny movie, but was it? All oh, right, okay. And her superpower uh, was luck. The downside, though, I, don't... I can't think of the name. All these good actors were in it, and they were playing like they were going to save the earth. And one girl's superpower was luck, and he's like, "Luck's not a superpower." She goes, "You don't think, huh?" And people trying to shoot her, and things would happen, and always protect her. It was just luck. Yeah, I think Napoleon says something about um, he, he he liked his generals to be lucky. I think it even goes back as far as that, if, if I remember rightly. I mean, that was a major, bapti- literally a baptism of fire for you, Tom. And then the global war on terror started in two thousand and one after the attack in the ten- twin towers. And it was a catalyst of 15 years of intense operations in Iraq and Afghanistan for the British, American, and other coalition armies. What were the deployments to Iraq like? Uh, what was your unit's focus? And can you tell listeners about the Christmas present you promised President Bush? <laughs> yeah, those deployments early on were like set up, um, you know, going after regime leaders, really, right? Going after the deck of cards, the regime leaders, the people who don't want to fight, right? And it was, so that was good in, in the sense that we had time to find where to live, build up where we were living, make it comfortable, plan our, our routes around town and figure out what we were doing while we were chasing these these guys who weren't really warriors, you know, all the fun, my, fun money guys and the, you know, all the financial dudes and all the planners and all the leaders, they don't fight, you know, they're babies, they don't want to do anything. Um, so they would typically, you'd get from the intel, most likely course of action, they're going to give up, you know? And then it slipped into, and I don't know what year, it just was every day ran into another, you know? But we did just as many hits, right? We, we Two, three hits a night, 90 days at a time, if not more a night. Um, sometimes they roll into the days, you do stay over missions where you hit a house and he's not there, so you stay and wait till he comes home and surprise him. So everything that you could think of, um, we would do. And those, it got harder when it rolled into, okay, we got a lot of the leaders gone, now the, the foreign countries are sitting their interest in here. You know, how can they mess with America while we're in Iraq? You know, and how can Al Qaeda bring in the foreign fighters? So the foreign fighters had no other choice but to fight. And some of them were pretty vicious, too. So that's when we started losing more people. That's when we started. Um, it started getting harder and more dangerous. You know, the most likely course of action will be they'll fight to the death because they religiously believe that that's what gets them to heaven. I'm like, great. We're fighting a dude that wants to die. So chances are you're going to get in a firefight. So it got more tense. And we had to change our tactics along the way. You know, we were doing hostage rescue, rescue tactics still. You know, surround the place, blow everything open and dominate right away. And then they blow the house up because they don't care. You know, and so we realized, all right, well, we can surround the place, get on the bullhorn with the interpreter and make them vote. Right. Come on out. Put your hands up and we'll we'll just arrest you and talk to you, man. Everything, everything will be good. You give you a soda later if you want, you know, but if they shot at us from the window, we could just bomb the place. You know, we didn't have to lose people to this. So we, we kind of learned a lot that this isn't hostage rescue. You don't have to be in a rush to die. You can hit this differently as a tactic. And so we learned a lot that way. Um, and then, yeah, we did. I got the opportunity. The Secret Service agent flew in um, right before Thanksgiving that year that President Bush visited. And they pulled me aside with my sergeant major and the Secret Service guy. He's like, hey, look, I'm uh, from Bush's team. No one knows he's coming except his his uh, ranch team in Texas. You know, the Secret Service in D.C. doesn't even know he's coming. They're keeping this a secret. So about four of us know about it, and you're one of them. I was like, okay. Can't even tell your boys. So we had to practice, though, right? I had to get our vehicles ready. I had to practice. I had to go to the airport and practice. So I had to tell the guys that the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders were coming. And they were pretty happy about that. <laughs> they, they were pretty happy about that. So we practiced, <laughs> practiced, and practiced over at the airport, at the Baghdad International Airport. And then uh, Thanksgiving Day, we're on the airfield, and, you know, and I'm there with the Secret Service agent with our vehicles. We got all the armored vehicles and all the boys wa- waiting. And down comes spiraling, you know, Air Force One. And it was like, oh, there I can see it. I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, sorry, guys. It's President Bush, man. He surprised visit to Iraq. Like, oh, shit. So they were excited. Um, he was going to go out and talk to everybody backstage, and they were going to feed um, Thanksgiving meal. And I was backstage with him, and he just, he talks, you know, he just likes to talk. He's one of those guys, and he, he looked at me, he's like, so, did you get him yet? And I was like, uh, well, you know, instantly you're, you don't know what to do. <laughs> the President of the United States asked you a question, <laughs> and I thought, that's no big deal. And instantly I'm like, oh, he asked me something serious. Like, you know, he wasn't just messing with me. Has to be something serious. And I don't know why. I said, you know, it'd be nice to get him. And yeah, we're getting close. You could have him by Christmas. And he looked at me and goes, that'd be real nice. I'm going to go talk to these boys. <laughs> and he walked out. And one of the agents walks over and he goes, did you just promise the president you'd, you'd have Saddam Hussein by Christmas? I go, I hope not. I really hope I didn't. 
And thank God we did. <laughs> thank God we got him that December um, 13th, I think. But thank God that happened. But yeah, I, it's one of those where you learn to keep your mouth shut. You know, you just, you just don't say anything. <laughs> or, or, or say your name Smith. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I didn't promise him shit, but it sounded like I did now that I look back on it. <laughs> He goes, you know, that's the president. You don't say anything to the president unless it's going to happen. I'm like, well, it happened. So get off my back about it. <laughs> <laughs> so after that then, Tom, your next deployment to Afghanistan. And, and, and reading your book, you can tell that, that, that despite the intensity you're talking about in Iraq, the pace of operations really picked up with the number of raids each evening increasing into double figures. Again, can you just talk us through a, 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 a typical mission if there was such a thing? And obviously at this time now, what becomes clear in your book is that things are starting to catch up on you. And this constant deployment at high tempo was having an effect on you physically and mentally. So you just describe that as well, please. Yeah, it, it literally got to a point where I wasn't sleeping. I literally could not sleep. I'd lay there all night, maybe 30 minutes, maybe. Um, I was waiting to get up and start looking at Intel. And I'd get up, I'd end up getting up six, seven, and eight in the morning. You know, we'd go to bed at four. And I'd, I'd be looking at Intel. Most people wake up at noon or one. And so I just was stuck in that, that battle rhythm and, and I couldn't calm down. And I don't know what it was. And people started noticing um, the, the missions would go on and on and on and on and on. And every mission we went on, I would try to turn it into uh, a worthy mission. Like, why did I risk the lives of my men? Well, we're going to make something happen out here is going to be the reason, you know, we went for a good reason and I'm going to make something really, really good happen. So we'd go from house to house to house. If one guy pointed, uh, here's some intel and it's taking us to two houses over here. I wouldn't even go back and plan. We'd just ride right to it and go and hit it before they could call each other. And it, it got to the point where my sergeant major one time was like, listen, I'm going to take your boys out. You're going to stay back. And I'm like, that can't happen. He's like, no, no, no. He, he literally, he goes, you are combat ineffective. Go to bed. And he wouldn't let me go plan or deploy or anything. And I wouldn't lay down. I'm like, there's no sleep. And so the doc comes in and he's like, here's this. He gives me four different pills and like a shot of alcohol. He goes, you won't, you won't wake up for two days. I'm like, all right. Like four hours later, I'm up, I'm walking, I'm looking through the talk and I'm like looking at the intel on the screen. I'm like, what's going on? Like, what are you doing out of bed? I'm like, I can't sleep. So for a week he went on missions with my boys and it was driving me crazy. But I finally calmed down and got some sleep and, and and talked him into putting me back. But it was, I didn't know it was affecting me. I just blamed something else. Like, you know, I just can't sleep. I, I don't know why I can't sleep. You know, I just, I just can't sleep. It's something wrong with me. So I need to work out more. <laughs> or maybe it's the food or maybe it's the, the bad hours or something. But I finally started le learning that my body was changing. Everything was adapting. You know, my stress levels were high. My, my fight, flight or free switch was never off. So I was never relaxing and I had to find ways to, to relax. So you know, you said earlier, Somalia didn't define who I was as an operator. I think it did. I think it, men mentally it defined me as an operator about that will never happen again. So I'm going to work so hard. Kind of that mentality I had before going to selections. So after Somalia hit, I thought I will train so hard. This will never happen again. Right. And of course, it happened in Iraq again. Another Black Hawk shot down. I'm in charge this time. And, and we're running out of water and the same old shit. But I realized, well, all you can do is be as ready as possible, right? You can't, you can't always be perfect. But you can't control the chaos, can no, you? No, you can't. And and I tried and tried and tried, and that was what was destroying me was to try to know everything that was going to happen. I I just couldn't, and it was it was killing me. So I started my body started breaking down. I mean, my I, I hurt my neck in an incident. And so I had a neck surgery, uh, four neck surgeries, you know, two quick ones and don't ever go put a helmet on your head again. I'm like two months later, I'm back in Iraq, running around with a helmet, like didn't tell anybody I wasn't supposed to be doing that. And all my own fault. But you just can't walk away from your men. And, you know, when you feel responsible, it's like, I'm the only one that could lead you ever. And so I can never leave. I got to be here and ruin my life doing it. But those missions just yeah. always being in the red um, and never relaxing. It just, I stayed that way always. I was always that way. Like I, people- It's weird because- Like- Sorry, so I'm going- well, People will be at like a, a level one. Normal people at level one. You make them angry, they might go to a five. You know, if you shoot their mom, they might, boom, they work their way to a 10. People like us, we start at sevens and fives. That's our one. So by the time you, you make me a little mad, I'm at a 10 already. So I'm raging for something I shouldn't be raging on because I'm always ready to rock and roll, you know, or I'm always ready to get violent with something. 
And that's when I started realizing that that's what a lot of people are kind of living like now. That's what a lot of a lot of soldiers or you know warriors are, are living that life of where they just kind of start at a five or a six, you know, and they they get stressed out and angry a lot quicker than most most people who haven't been in those situations. It's interesting because people look at World War Two and they think that soldiers in World War Two are constantly on the front line, constantly at that high tempo and alertness that you've just described but they weren't you know i think the british army they're in the line for six weeks then be withdrawn for a few weeks generally speaking you know they, they would get some rest but from what i understand from your book and what you've described there you'd be out there for months at a time and constantly at that peak were, were i right in saying then that really delta wasn't really set up for enduring operations like this because going back to how small the organization is do you think there's some cases that were not misemployed but people didn't appreciate the effect it was having on the operators and the operators themselves probably wouldn't admit it and you were then caught in a vicious circle that is exactly it that is a vicious cycle of a leader comes in and wants to get his right the last commander just came Mm. in and got his combat time with his men right we were war for 20 years so the next commander comes in he's got to get his you know, during a war, if you don't get your combat time, you're not going to get promoted, right? Because those that have combat time are probably going to get promoted over you. So everybody wants theirs. Mm. Now do that in a top unit, a tier one unit where everybody's been going 20, 20 deployments, you know, 20 deployments. And here comes a new officer. I want to go get mine. People are literally like, uh-uh, nope. You know, I mean, it was, uh, it's to the point where we were, we were killing ourselves and the operators will never admit it, like you said, never admit it's killing them. Right. They won't admit it now when they get out. They won't admit that it, it, it yeah. that it destroyed them then now and get help for it now because it just seems like weakness versus overwork. Right. Overwork of one percent of the force doing ninety nine percent of the work over and over again when they were really meant for in and out. Right. I'm on target for 10 to 15 minutes, maybe. And then I'm gone. Right. Yeah. I'm not I'm not supposed to be sitting on target for days and and doing it again the next day and doing it again the next day and you know in case of emergency break glass, right? Not not break the glass and let it all out because it, you know we don't have that force anymore, right? We don't have that break glass in case of emergency force anymore. Everybody's burnout. Everybody's running around doing commando stuff, right? Kicking indoors and nobody's doing what their legacy tasks tasks were to always do. And so now everybody's a commando, everybody's an operator, everybody's kicking indoors, and uh, and then finally the war's over, and everybody's like, well, now we need to all go back to our legacy tasks and figure out what that is again, because we need that mm. that organization of, of trainers. Not, not everybody's a doer. Um, we need those nation builders, right? And that's that's the hardest part of a war is you can dis- defeat the, the military, right? But Now, the insurgency is another thing, but you can defeat the military, the uniform military, easily. Now to feed the insurgency and, and to get the water running and the electricity back so the people don't hate you for being there. Because it's like, oh, yeah, America, America, Mr. Bush, Mr. Bush, yes, Hollywood, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, where's my water? Get out. Go home, Yankee. You know, like that's that's in a week. <laughs> they go from loving you and yeah. you saved them to get the hell out. You ruined my life. And it's like, man, how do you live like that, right? These people will love us. And then they're throwing shit at you and trying to burn your vehicles up as you drive by. And you're like, wait a minute. I thought you loved this. Yeah, overused. Um Definitely overused. And then it does so well, what do you keep doing? You keep overusing it. <laughs> you get results, I'm going to keep using you, right? And then guys come home and, yeah. and kill themselves or kill their wives and then kill themselves. And, and it's like, this is not normal behavior. All that takes its toll. Yeah. And we need to look at how often you stick people in the meat grinder like that without getting them the help they need to be prepared to go back into the meat grinder. In your book, you write that you can trace your PTS back to Mogadishu, but generally you're able to keep it compartmentalized, you know, and despite your coping mechanisms being far from healthy. And one of the things that struck me from the book was your description of warrior culture, which we've just touched on a little bit there. And the unit is very much an alpha male environment. If you couldn't make the grade, you were out. And you also write candidly about imposter syndrome. It just amazes me you're able to function at such a high level with all these pressures. And ultimately, is that what caught up with you? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I spent my entire career after Somalia thinking and doing more. I need to be better. I need to do more. I need to do that. I need to run further. I need to shoot longer. I need to shoot faster. I need, you know, new weapons. What's this? What's the technology? Getting the best things that would keep us ahead of everything else 
And I didn't realize that all of those years I kept saying, I need to do more, I need to do more, I need to be better. My brain's hearing, you're not good enough, you're not good enough, you're not good enough, right? And so I'm never mm-hmm. feeling good enough because I'm always wanting to be better. I'm always comparing myself to the new guy coming in or, or some guy I don't even know. I don't know somebody. He looks tough. He looks fit. You know, oh, I bet he's better than me than all of those things, you know. So that imposter syndrome of how did I make it here? How, how am I even here? I'm not I'm not good enough to be here. And then I found out everybody that I worked with out there, you know, I say everybody, almost everybody I worked with out there thought the same thing at all levels, Mm -hmm. you know, um, how did I get here? Everybody's better at this than I am. So we all never felt good enough. And I think it's just part of, a lot of it's part of post-traumatic stress. Um, a lot of it is wanting to do better. A lot of it is the comparison, right? We compare ourselves to everything and everybody's always better typically, unless you're a narcissist and then you're better and then nobody wants to be around you. But it's one of the, (laughs) it was one, yeah, it's one of those things of, I spent 20 years telling myself I'm not good enough. And then when I got out and I had nothing to do, I'm like, man, I'm I, I'm done. My life's over. That thing that was me, that thing that I'm all about and that makes who I am is gone and I'll never have it back, you know? So that's when you really start telling yourself, oh, if I wasn't good enough then, I'm not good enough now because I'm not going to do any of that stuff anymore. So my worthiness has gone down to zero. And uh, yeah, that's when people start thinking about taking their, their lives. I mean, my thought process was I'm in the way. I came here to be a warrior. I was a warrior. I have nothing else to do, you know? And now I look back and I'm like, well, I'm saving more lives now than I ever saved. You know, it's uh, and I'm doing more than I ever did in, in importance wise, if you ask me. So that's so sad feelings that we get when we've, you know, you think about a pro athlete, they, the same thing, right? Tom Brady just retired uh, yeah. again. You know, what's he going to do? He's going to go crazy unless he finds out something that keeps him busy and happy. It's like professional boxers, isn't it? They'll go back into the ring despite, you know, the brain damage and all the <laughs> other bits and pieces. But because, you know, it's, and as, those sports analogies are pretty good. In your book, you describe PTS saying, um, and I quote now, PTS is a thief. In addition to the depression and anger, it robs you of your sense of security and self-worth. It even steals your ability to feel like you deserve good things to happen in your life. And... Going back to when you were in the military, I remember you, you write about going to see a doctor. Uh, you, you finally decide to go and see a doctor, and he said, oh, I've been expecting you, but you've held out for a lot longer than most. At what point did you d- realize you had a problem, Tom? Uh, I think my shitty decision-making, uh, my bad decisions, lots of drinking, poor decision-making process, the stress I felt... Um, I was divorcing, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what, what wife I had at the time. You know, I, I had three divorces in that unit and it was, it was just, um, I finally went to the doc. I'm like, man, I don't sleep. I'm always angry. You know, he throws Prozac at me and he said that, yeah, you waited this long and most people are on, on it. And I'm like, whoa, what? <laughs> I didn't want drugs, you know? And I, I, t- I took him for a little bit and all I wanted to do was take a nap. Right in the middle of the day, I'd never napped in the middle of the day, and I and I started napping like oh, I'm just tired. Months into it, I was like, "This is not me. I can't nap all the time. I feel lethargic now." So it was like they immediately doped me up to take me down. I couldn't I couldn't live that way, so I just stopped taking them, which really messed me up because um, you're supposed to wean off that shit. And I just stopped taking it. So that risky behavior got worse and got worse, and all that things that they tell you about. So I started making even worse decisions, and it was just. You know, if you didn't get caught doing it, you could stay in the unit. It was okay, right? But anything that you would get kicked out of the unit for in trouble for, that's that's what terrified me. And it was a it was a mm. shitty thought process to have. Um all of that kind of just destroyed who you destroys who you are. You know, I never felt I never I get mad at holidays. Right. I, would, I, just, I don't know why I get angry at holidays. And it's because I don't feel people are like, oh, well, your friends aren't alive. You don't feel like you deserve it. No, it's just um, I don't have those emotions anymore. Right. I don't know why I don't have that joy. I had lost all that joy and empathy and compassion. And until recently, recent years, I had I had none of it back, none of it back. And when you lose empathy, and compassion, then you don't emulate or care about anybody else. You know, you. You can't walk in someone else's shoes, so you you lose all empathy, and then everything else is like, well, you should have thought of that, you know, when you were younger, and you wouldn't be in such a tough spot. Get yourself out of it. 
And then finally, when I started getting it back again, it was it literally started. Um, I was working at a, a soup kitchen, handing out food to the homeless because I had to because I got in trouble. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, I got to go hang out with these losers of the earth, you know. <laughs> and I went in and I started building and developing more empathy and compassion. These humans that just needed food and had a rough time. And I stopped judging people. You know, the start of me not judging people instantly right away again started then. We did a podcast with a friend of mine who, um, we did a tour in Northern Ireland in the late 80s and a couple of guys in the troop got killed and he had bad PTSD and we were talking about his PTS on the podcast and he turned and I said, oh, do you remember we stuck you in a bottom room because your nightmares were keeping us awake and I was laughing about it and then afterwards when we finished the podcast, I had this terrible guilt, A, that... I didn't realize what we were doing at the time because we didn't really know about PTS. And then guilt that I laughed about it. And I had to phone him up and go, I didn't understand back then. I just absolutely overwhelmed with guilt. And I just think your mind's a funny thing. And that, you know, 35 years later, I can be overwhelmed by those feelings talking to somebody. And this guy's in Australia at the time. I hadn't spoken for a long time. So I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a very complicated situation, though, all these things we're describing here. Yeah, they, they make that impression on your brain. If you think about it, I mean, Somalia was, what, 25 years ago-ish, almost. If I think about it, mm. I'll start crying. If I start to share too much of a story and I get to it, I've done it so much to this point now, it's not as much. But even right now, if someone asked mm. me something I hadn't spoken about often about Somalia and I started to tell the story, I would get deeply emotional. And I'm thinking 25 years mm. later, it still has an effect. So anything that makes an impression in your brain, you know? And then there's things I can't think about growing up as a kid. Like we were talking about it last night with my wife about growing up. Do you remember fun times with your family? And I'm like, I can't think of one time sitting on the couch around with my family. We're all laughing and joking, you know? And I'm thinking back all those years growing up before high school, I can't think of us all sitting. I know we did, but I can't think of those times, mm. but I can sure whip up a memory of something horrible real quick, you know, and, and it'll all be in my head. Our brains defer to that negativity. That's why we say mm -hmm. comparison's a thief. You know, it's uh, people compare my combat time's not like yours, so I don't need help. Well, no, that's that's not a true statement, right? So comparison's a thief of healing and and a thief of of our stories that we compare. But you know, if guys would just oh god, talking to a guy today, help my friend. He's drinking too much. He's with his son. You know, he doesn't. He's depressed and all the things I went through. He's like, what can I do to help him? I've been talking to him for a couple of months. I'm worried about him. I go, you can't do anything. Unless he wants help, nobody can help him. If he wants help, then boom, he's on the right track, right? I won't call anybody and say, hey, I heard you need help. Here's what you need to do. Because they're going to hang up on me. They won't want it. Somebody wants help. they got to want the help. They've got to understand they need the help. And then they'll get it. Then it's easy. And then you can change. But those things mm -hmm. that have made that impression on your brain those years ago, don't go away. They get worse unless you deal with them. And you can get left to field things. You know, the same guy we talked to in that podcast when we were discussing uh, the incident where, where, where our friends were killed. He was, there was an IED hit the vehicle and he, he remembers being trapped in the vehicle with gasoline coming up from the tanks that were split coming over him mm. and the smell of the blood. And at the time we talked to him, he was doing okay. Then I heard from him a month later, I just phoned up to say, how, how are you doing? He said, oh, I'm having a bad time. He, he, he's a cop in Australia. He attended an RTA and the guy was pretty smashed up and there was gasoline everywhere mm. and blood. And he said he just he just had an episode. He just had a fla flashback, couldn't cope and end up being off work for a while. So even though he was coping, those sensory overloads that he had at the time came flooding back and just put him you know, back into those that, that situation. You have to really be careful about that. Anytime I smell bleach, I'm, I'm right there in Samoya that morning, October 4th. Right, too much bleach. Boom, it takes me back. Yeah. But it's one of those... Um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, smells and sounds um can really trigger your memory to take you back to even places you don't remember without it. We've, we've talked about sort of the mental side there, and another thing that was interesting about your book was I learned there's physiological and biological responses to prolonged stress. And uh, I know we talked about this in the sort of the icebreak at the start, but can you just expand a little bit on that, Tom? I know you, you're not a, a doctor or that, but can you just give listeners a flavor for what I'm trying to get to with this? Yeah, it's uh. A lot of guys we want to help is like, hey, you, you tell somebody about, hey, mental strength or mental capacity or mental illness. People immediately go to, oh, somebody who's crazy or back in the days of, oh, you need to be in a hospital. You can't, you can't manage yourself, your life. 
that's not what we're talking about when we talk about mental health in this this capacity. Um, and it is a physiological, it is a physical change in your body, right? We all think, well, I just feel bad, right? Well, if you just feel bad, then don't feel bad, right? Get over it. Rub dirt on it. Suck it up. All that stuff. Sure. Single incidences, small incidences, people move on, move right past them. They're built for that. But when you have extended, continuing uh, circumstances like this, of this gravity, it has a physical change to your body. Your body is always trying to adapt and change to protect itself. Always. Always. It's always about protection, right? And viruses even want to stay alive. Everything wants to stay alive. So your brain starts to to change. Your body starts to change to help. And, and, and if you're not aware of that, you just think it's you. Oh, I'm just crazy. I'll just get over it. I need to... I need to just man up. You know, it doesn't work. I tell her you can't commando yourself through this, you know. And so I use this also to share with people who who call up and want some. They think they want help and they're going to tell me how I'm going to help them. And they're like, I don't want to talk to a therapist unless they've been to combat because they won't understand what I'm going through. And I'm like, really now? Because our therapist doesn't want to talk to you unless you've gone to school for four to six years either. Because, you know, <laughs> do, do you understand how stupid that sounds? And when you were in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force or Marines, did you win the war yourself? Or were there people that did their job that you didn't have a clue how to do? That's what the psycholo psychologists are. That's what they do. They come in. They don't have to know that you went to combat. They just want to know how you feel now. Now they're going to help you feel better, right? Because the process is pretty much the same. Whether you're a CEO of an organization or a salesman and you're always gone and you're not connected to your family and you're growing apart, it's the same process to get to get better. But we used to think it's just, well, I just don't feel good. Well, now you can actually do a brain scan. You can actually take blood. There's biomarkers that determine you have post-traumatic stress. You can see the brain scan, the parts of your brain that aren't getting enough oxygen or getting too much oxygen. And then you can take over-the-counter drugs, not medications, over-the-counter drugs, healthy things, to reverse this. Um so we remove that invisible wounds of war because they're not invisible anymore, right? It's like a it's like a broken bone inside your arm, but we know it's broken by touching it. We can move it around even though we couldn't see it or we can x-ray it. So now you can scan your brain and you can tell what's wrong with it and you can tell how to fix it. And that what that what that's done is is your brain is trying to protect itself from the fight fight or flees, re, freeze response. And so there's different things you can do. You can get a a, a dual sympathetic reset shot, which is a stellate nerve shot. You know, on both sides of your neck to kind of do the dry erase board, mm -hmm. reset your brain and your po your uh, fight, flight, or freeze response to where you don't feel like you're always late under pressure or um, under duress, and you feel calm. I've had these. I've, I've done this, and you feel calm. And now you'll that that could last, you know, four months, six months, a year, whatever. And during that time, that's when I need to get to work with my psychologist or psychiatrist on behavior change. Because my behavior affects other people. That's what's wrong. If we want to think about it, when I act poorly, it affects other people. So I need behavioral <laughs> change. And to do that, I need to change the muscle memory that I've developed over time, 25 years of getting medals for being aggressive, getting awarded for being violent. Um, that's what saved my life, making split rash decisions and harshly talking to people to get things done now. When I try to fit that into my life with my kids and wife now, it does not work. You know, turn the car here now. Mm. She's like, whoa, whoa, you don't need to yell. I'm not yelling. It's like, wait a minute now. This is a bit aggressive. I'm not aggressive. We'll argue the fact. But we've changed as humans because we've behaved a certain way for so long. We have to change ourselves back to what we want to be. And it might be 10,000 mm -hmm. repetitions or 90 days of the same thing. But we know we're going to default back to that negative cycle again. We're going to be aggressive again. So that's a start. We've got to start over again. That's a lot of work. And most people would just rather defer to isolation and drinking than to put in all that work to feel better. But yet they want to feel better, but they but they think they're going to feel better by sitting there and doing nothing. Um, your body has changed, and it's going to stay that way or get worse if you do nothing. And I can tell everybody that. And there's proof out there in the brain scans, the blood draws, the fact that your low T's down, the, you know, your, your, your hormones are down from all the stress and the things that all these physical things that are changing how you feel is a lot more than just I don't feel good because Johnny got killed at war. Most people mm. don't come to us crying about, well, I lost all my friends in war and this and that. You know, they come to us saying I'm isolating. I'm drinking too much. I, I you know, I thought think about killing myself every day, maybe three times a day. Yeah. OK, that sounds normal to me. You know, and they just want help with that. Nobody's saying I lost too many people. And then most people are, you know, it finds out it was childhood trauma. 
right? Something in, during their childhood mm -hmm. that they brought into that's now exacerbated and brought up because of combat. And you work on that and everything else just falls right into place, you know, but I'd say... Well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of veterans you can trace back to things that happened when they were growing up. Yep. Yep. You know, and, and wow. if they don't think about it either, because they're, they're trying to find that, that square peg that's fitting that square hole, and they really got a round looking hole in a square place. peg, and they're like, oh, you're looking in the wrong spot, you know, and they talk to them long mm. enough, you'll figure it out, and then once they crack that nut, they're like, oh, all right, I'm all better. I can, some guys take a couple of days, some guys take six months, you know. We did an interview with uh, a U.S. Marine called Chris Whitmore last year, and as part of the research for that, I was shocked at the U.S forces suicide rate amongst veterans and you know another flip side of that as i also was reading that 75 percent of civilians fail entry to the u.s forces so i'm puzzled and that's the same in the british army why there's not better care taken on veterans during their service and post service and you look at those suicide rates over in the states there tom why is that a national issue i mean it's well known amongst veterans but why is this not a political scandal if you like I could be wrong. This is Tom talking. This is my opinion hmm. from what I've seen. Money. It takes a lot of money, right. right? It takes a lot of money. What value in those humans do you hold? You know, and what do our leaders think of us as humans, right? Do, do you think your leaders hmm. look at us like, oh, we're equals? Or I need to keep you people away and keep you happy enough to keep you from violating, you know, rioting or something or overthrowing the government. Honestly, it's always money. It's always money. And and if nobody will ever admit this, nobody will admit it. But if it wasn't money, why aren't we? You're right. Why aren't we helping more mm -hmm. people? Well, because it's too expensive. <laughs> and if we admit it, then we have to pay for it forever. Right. And when I look at the VA system and everybody, oh, the VA sucks. Well, the VA is a very big thing trying to take care of a lot. Of, you know, I don't know how many millions of veterans that are how old? from what wars that we're still paying for and taking care of. So it's a big system you're going to get in line, right? You're going to get in line and wait. But the money's not there. And the fact that, it, um, honestly, if you think about it, if a soldier commits suicide, he doesn't get the retirement. He doesn't get health care anymore. He doesn't get anything. His spouse doesn't get anything anymore. And you don't have to pay for it at the VA either. Now, are our leaders that horrible? No. But if we had the money to do it, why, why aren't we doing it? That's a good question because it's doable. It's doable through counseling. You can make it mandatory, like sexual harassment training, like LGBTQ training, all that other shit we got to fit into. How come keeping ourselves alive isn't one of those things that you make mandatory for me to do? When you come back from a, a deployment, you'll have to sit down and talk to somebody at least three times so they know when you're lying, covering up, or figuring it out, right? And that'll take time, mm -hmm. and that'll take money, and they don't want to put the money on that. They want to put it on something else, probably. I also think it's from the UK perspective, I think it's an embarrassment factor as well. You know, they've sent all these people, and you know, let's not be naive about it. You know, politicians make war and soldiers fight them, yeah. and and that's what you're paid to do. You know, but I think in some cases there's an embarrassment factor there when you see people with broken minds and all the rest of it. That's not the image they want to prepare. Uh, put on the news every night of soldiers, you know, the heroic soldiers and all the rest of it. I think so. I think there's an embarrassment factor at play at times as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. And then nobody signs up, right? Oh, well, if that's yeah. where I'm going to end up, I'm going to go do another job, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's just not good. Yeah. It's just not good for the government. It's not good for anybody to hear about it. Um, and we already know they've, they've kept the numbers low. The numbers are probably more like 48 a day. Well, that's, that's shocking. Yeah, it's sad. So, yeah, that's bad. And But, you know, we've already touched on a bit of the work that you and Jen doing together. And you met Jen when you were, you described it in a book as a low point. You're working with a production company teaching civilians how to shoot zombies. And uh, you also describe it in the book as a period where you hit rock bottom. Uh, so I get the impression that Jen literally saved your life because in the book you describe you were about to take your life and there was a, Jen was saying something was wrong, kept phoning you up. Yeah, she, uh, she'll argue with you on that. <laughs> she will argue. Will she? <laughs> she will argue that she did nothing, but that's her. And yeah. that's what we say now. Did she save my life? No. Was she in a place that allowed me to save myself? Yes. Um, did she stop me? Yes. Did she teach me things and force me to do things I wasn't going to do? Yes. I say she saved my life. Yes. 
my wife will be like, mm. I don't, I wish I had that power. I don't have that power. I just, you know, we're the lighthouse, you know, we're, she, she, she says, we're the lighthouse for people. And I go, aren't you supposed to go away from a lighthouse? Like, don't go there. Cause that's where the land is. She says, you get my point, right? And I go, yeah, yeah, I get your point. But so we, we want to be that lighthouse for people to show them it can be done. And, and here's how we did it. But really that's all we can do. Cause people have to put in the work and they have to want to put in the work or it'll never work. Right. When I didn't want to put in the effort, it didn't work. When I was faking it, mm -hmm. it didn't work, you know, and I went through the whole phase. Yes, I'll get help. Yes, I'm getting help. And I was lying. You know, no, I'm not drinking. You sound drunk. Well, I'm not drunk, damn it. You know, so I went through the whole denial lying thing. Um, she was persistent. And yeah, she did save my life with her persistency, um, with her texting me, you're late, just knowing me enough that she knows I don't ever want to be late. And when I saw I was late, I would rather not kill myself than be late. So she didn't know I was going to mm -hmm. do that or was doing that at the time, but she just was scared and she wanted to see what was up. So she texted you late and she knew that I, I, I wouldn't sit for that. And so as soon as I saw that, I put everything away, cleared my pistol and took off around like, what, what, what? I didn't know we had anything. She's like, no, no, we don't. Let's just go sit down in the bar over here and have a chat. And so I told her a couple months later what, what she had done. And that's when we realized how easy it is to pause something, to stop something, to interrupt something, you know, um, and that it just needs to be something of hope or something that's important to you. We interviewed a, a, an ex Chinook crew chief called Liz McConaughey, and she um, she took an overdose. And she described to us that the day she took the overdose, she got dressed properly because she didn't want to be found, you know, not looking her best. She even put makeup on, and she took an overdose. She woke up in hospital, were uh, uh, intubated, and doctors round her and she said it was I had this overwhelming feeling at that point I didn't want to lie uh, I didn't want to die and it goes back to the comment about earlier on we discussed how your mind plays tricks on you and she said you know her mind had made up her mind that she wanted to die that day but she actually didn't and she said she was very lucky to come back from that day so when you were con contemplating taking your life did you ever have a moment like that where you thought I don't want to do this, or was it a gradual process you had to sort of wean yourself away from those suicidal thoughts? I didn't want to do it. And I, I almost committed suicide probably four or five or I don't know, times since then. Um, and it was just, those are passionate moments. That day, that first time was not a passionate day. It was a, it was a, man, this sucks. This is, I'm, this is sucks. It's never going to be better. I'm in the way. I'm just, and I did not want to die. I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. um, I started studying suicide after that a little bit, and I found articles about people who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, not very many people live. But to a person, every person that has lived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge has said the exact same thing. They regretted it immediately the, hand, the moment their hand let go of the rail. They did not want to die anymore. And I concluded that nobody wants to die, and if there's a way out, you'll take it. But jumping off a bridge doesn't leave a way out. You know, you, you, you hit the water and you're going to shatter all your bones. And if you live, you know, you're lucky. And I, and I, and I decided mm -hmm. nobody really wants to kill themselves. It's a cry for help. The ones that want to mm -hmm. kill themselves, kill themselves. You don't know anything about it. You, you can't stop it. You wouldn't have stopped it no matter what. They were, on, they were set to do it. Um, could you have interrupted it? Maybe. But they're the ones that walk off and do it without writing a note, calling somebody, say, I'm going to go kill myself and give somebody like five seconds to stop me. Anybody want to stop me? You know, those are cries for help. And I think mine in the car that day was a, was a, I'm, I didn't tell anybody. So it wasn't a cry for help. It was a, it was a try an attempt to, to end it. And it was hard. And then after that, I've done, you know, I've done things emotionally and angry and, and thank God I didn't complete it. But it was, um, I don't think most people do want to do that. I think they feel so hopeless and helpless that they're just waiting to hear one little squeak of hope or help, and they'll stop the process. What you described there, Liz said the exact same thing. She had, um, once she took those pills, she made an emergency call. Uh, and funnily enough, when she was looking through her phone log, she was saying that she must have been, this has happened during lockdown, during COVID, and she must have been watching too many American films on uh, Netflix because she tried to dial 911 a couple of times, <laughs> and it's 999 in the UK. Oh, no. <laughs> 
got to get that number <laughs> so right. She's got a good sense. Of, <laughs> yeah, she's got a good sense of humor, Les. So she was, uh, but I, I'm I'm really struck by the similarities and and what we've talked about with your situation and and her situation, and really moving on now to your foundation, All Secure. And I'll post links to All Secure in our show notes for people so they can look at your website and that, Tom, and also your podcast you do with Jen. So can you just give us a, a, a heads up on why you set All Secure up? Probably going to really discuss that already, but what it does and the impact it's having on you and Jen and the people you're helping. Yeah, we set up All Secure originally just to be a resource library, to be a place that anybody could go to to find those things to help you transition and retire because it was a nightmare for us. She was trying to help me and I was, you know, trying to figure out what was going on with me, not to retire, but the post-traumatic stress when you're feeling horrible. It was like, where do we go to get help? How do we find it? Um, I'm always angry. I'm drinking too much. What, what's the problem? What do we tackle first? So we went down that, that horrible path, that struggle. And once we figured it out, we put it to paper. This is, this is the path now, right? This is the easy path that we did all the shit for you. Here's the way that works. And this, had I done this, it'd have been great. And so anything anybody needed, they could go to allsecurefoundation.org and find it. Um, and then we kind of went into, well, we want to help people. We want to actually just help people instead of showing them where to go get help. So we brought on our first counselor, coach. We'll call her a coach. Um, she's a licensed clinical social worker. But through four to five different therapists that we had gone to, none of them worked. And she worked. She was amazing. We call her our golden unicorn of healing now, but I've got her locked in my basement. I'm never letting her go. But she uh, she was a civilian, never worked with military at all till me, till us. Now she's a convert. I love military. You tell them what to do, they do it. Where these civilians, they just pet their cat all day and tell me how their life sucks. When, you know, <laughs> civilians, you give them actions and they go do it. They want to get better, you know, versus just talk to a friend for 20 years. You know, so we started that. Now we're on our we're hiring our fourth uh, ther our fourth coach. Um, we call them coaches, but they're all licensed clinical social workers. So they're trained, but it's over state lines and whatnot. So it's coaching. It's not therapy, right? For insurance purposes and mm -hmm. lawsuits, blah blah blah. But it's it's coaching, and we also run retreats, four to six couples retreats with ten couples each um, at nice locations for a four day intensive. You're going to sit here for two straight days and talk about your relationship. We're going to give you tools to practice how to speak to your spouse and work back together because they've all grown apart and they all want divorce and they all hate each other and they don't know how to talk anymore. So 92% of people we talk to want help with their relationships at home. So we'll do that and we help them. Uh, and then we let them go out on date nights and, and practice and come back and talk about it the next day. And so we give them a time off. We give them time to reconnect, but we also give them the tools to reconnect with. And then with that, we also travel to military bases and all year long and talk to any active duty people, um, organizations and units that want to hear about how to, you know, we're not at war now, but we will be. And when we do go to war, you want to be ready. And here's the lessons we learned from the last 20 years that we've been at war of how to stay healthy while you're at war. And then that will lead to when you're out of war. That way it won't be such a struggle. But yeah, we provide that, um, and we partner with other organizations that do like the Dual Sympathetic Reset Shot or Warrior's Heart that helps people with drugs and alcohol addiction and post-traumatic stress. And if it's more faith-based, we send people to different organizations. So we find out what the veteran needs, and, and if they're special mm -hmm. operations, we're the organization that helps all special operations, any service, and, and your spouse you know, and your, or significant other. So we started with helping the spouses as well. And even if the veteran's like, I'm fine, or the warrior's like, I don't need help, like they all say, the spouse does, you know, and, and they don't seem to have an issue admitting it. So we'll, we'll help them, whether the warrior or the veteran gets it anyway. We'll help the spouse anyway, because we know that that battle buddy system at home can be very helpful. Yeah, that, that struck me, actually, is uh, the, the emphasis you put on the spouses, because I think too often family gets forgotten. And I think you do neglect, and uh, certainly, you know, I neglected my wife during my service, but... It's, I think that was one of the main things that struck me was how you're trying to help families. And uh, is this helping you as well, Tom? Is it, is it, is it, do you feel you're giving something back in some respects? Yeah. You know, like I said, I, I learned empathy and compassion when I started serving food at the, you know, the, for the homeless. I learned it again, doing something different. I learned more about close quarters battle when I was teaching it than when I, you know, than when I was mm -hmm. taught it and did it for years. So, Teaching helps you learn a different aspect of what you already knew. Um, living in other people's lives, like I was living w within the lives of those homeless people's lives for breakfast and lunch, 
you know, up, up until the afternoon was like, wow, um, I developed empathy. So it was very cathartic for me to, one, write my book about what I had been through, say the things that nobody wants to say. Um, and just say it, say it once. And then you can't, you know, there it is. It's on print. I can't take it back. People can laugh about it and talk about it, but it was cathartic. It was healing. And, and it is more healing for me to help other people as well. I mean, I help myself along the way. Every time I go to a retreat, my wife and I are at all the retreats, you know, so we go and we sit and we're listening to all the therapy as well. We, we practice in all the things mm -hmm. that they practice in. And then we walk around and talk to the families and help them as well. Um, but every time I go, I learn something more. I learn something from the other families. You know, those elbows are flying when husbands are talking about the bad stuff they do. And wives are like elbowing their husband. Like, you do that, too. And I'm like, yeah, we're all connecting right now. And this is how we heal. <laughs> so once we start connecting, everybody's laughing and elbowing each other. Like, you do that. You do that. And they're like, oh, see, we all do the same shit. Now we can connect and work on it. And it's like a big family working together. And then they, they stay connected for years after that on social media and become friends. And they still, they still even after retreats, see our therapists, you know, for the time that they needed. And it's all paid for. No, great work, Tom. So thanks for uh, closing that one uh, off for us. So we're going to finish off now with Desert Island Dits, which is the guest choice of book, film, and luxury item if they were unfortunately marooned on a desert island. So, Tom, what have you picked as your book, film, and luxury item choice? All right. I picked... Now, I picked the Bible as my book choice, but I actually picked the book called The Dake. It's like an annotated Bible, and it breaks down. It's like the King James. It's an older version. I'm not, I'm not a religious man. I'm a spiritual guy, but mm -hmm. the Bible is a book full of stories I've never read. That The Dake is a book that has the annot annotation reference Bible that breaks down what they meant. They tell you what it meant from the original writings, so you're not getting like some political version of what they want you to believe the Bible to be or whatever, a religious version, you know. So it's very thick. It would take a long time to read, and it's very. It, it's also very helpful on how to how to feel and believe. So I thought, well, if I ever get off the island, maybe I'll be a better human for it. My film choice. Um, now, if I get the leeway of a series, a TV show, is that'd be a film. Well, we'll let you have a shout for. It has to be a film first, but we'll give you give us a heads up on your TV series as well. All right. Well, if it's a film, I pick Castaway just because it's ironic. <laughs> <laughs> but if i could pick a series nobody's no, nobody's picked that one yet <laughs> if i could pick a series i'd pick alone because there's like nine seasons and they teach you how to survive <laughs> and while doing it alone so it might be a little bit helpful for me i'm sure as a delta operator you don't need many lessons in uh, survival tom surely well i spent a lot of time in hotels so i i, I don't i don't like the bug stuff you know <laughs> <laughs> and so with the luxury item, um, I don't know how luxury I can get with it. I picked like an RV powered by solar panels. <laughs> so I have all the, That's a proper all the luxury. comforts of home right there. <laughs> That's a very American choice as well, Tom. <laughs> you got a toilet, you got a bed, you got shelter, all right there. <laughs> so um, yeah, normally I wouldn't allow that but that's cheeky enough that you, that you can certainly have that one I picked fire so, starter as well after that like if, if I don't get the RV <laughs> then I then I need fire <laughs> no I can definitely have an RV mate so right my, my choice then is, is, is Tom's book All Secure uh, because I learned an awful lot from it as I've already discussed throughout this podcast uh, and I, I say to Tom a lot of military books you read written by SF people, I think they're trying sometimes to cater to a specific audience. But uh, in some respects, I think, Tom, your book might well put off people wanting to be an SF operator. <laughs> so I think so. You're sort of kicking against the grain a little bit. That's why they don't like my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very... Uh, it certainly opened my knowledge up about a lot of things, Tom. So, no, I, I really enjoyed it. So that's it for another episode. Tom, thanks a lot for coming to the podcast. And uh, thanks to the listener for your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming. And our email and social media links are at the bottom of the show notes. You can find us in all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've downloaded from iTunes and like the podcast, it would be great if you could leave us a review there or anywhere you get a podcast from. And finally, thanks again to Nick Beale for his continued support to the series and offering technical help for his company ISAR. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier. Mm -hmm.